So it's a real pleasure to welcome you in this conference room for our first in-person CLET workshop dedicated to bioproduction and in vitro diagnostic. So I'm Sandrine Catroux, VP of Sales and Marketing at CLET, and I will be your chairwoman during the full day. Uh, so welcome again in this room, and thank you for being here uh, today. You are all survivors. I think you survived the COVID and the flu. So I will ask uh, to, to keep the mask on your face. It's compulsory at CLET and especially in this room. So thank you for cooperation to make this event a success and keep your mask on. Um, you are also survivors uh, because, uh, because of the snow, the rain, the wind today. I know that uh, some people come uh, from uh, outside France and are foreigners. So thank you for them, uh, for being here. And also because uh, you didn't believe it was uh, April Fool's Day, so thank you to believe it was a really in-person meeting. And uh, to be honest, it's really refreshing to see uh, real people again in this conference room and not virtual people. So thank you again. Uh, we have a terrific program ahead of us with uh, 20 speakers. Um, coming from the industrial world and the academic world, they will share their vision on innovation on microtechnologies. This morning we will focus on bioproduction and in the afternoon we will cover the in vitro diagnostic part. Um, well, let's start the session. So just uh, an announcement, you will be able to ask questions to the speaker only at lunchtime or during the tours or after the talks, and not during the talks. Uh, this session will be uh, in replay mode in a, in a few days on internet. So let's open the conference on bioproduction uh, with uh, Mrs. Nadej Nef. Uh, welcome on the stage, uh, Mrs. Nef. So Nadej Nef is a deputy head uh, of uh, a department called Microtechnologies for Biology and Healthcare. She works at LITI. She spent 10 years in the pharmaceutical CDMO industry before joining CLIT. Mrs. Nief, welcome uh, on the stage again. Uh, Bonjour so, à tous. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Uh, last year, uh, the French government announced an investment plan, a major one, on bioproduction and biotherapies. And uh, innovations are fueling the roadmap. How is LITI involved and what are LITI's strategies, means and ecosystem? Thank you, Sandrine, for the introduction. Before answering your question, I will spend a few minutes to present you Grenoble and our ecosystem. So, uh, Grenoble is the second innovative city in France, and uh, we are actually in a unique uh, ecosystem regarding industrial, uh, industrial activities. So, we are made of three uh, valleys, technological valleys, in microelectronics, imager, and display. And on top of this uh, rich industrial ecosystem with a lot of key uh, industrial players such as ST Microelectronic, SOITEC, Thales and Trixel, we also have a very strong research team in many fields. On top of that, we have a very rich and dynamic uh, system for creating startup and highly uh, well-ranked uh, university and engineering school with more than 10,000 students uh, <laughs> in many areas. So, on top of that, we have Leti. And Leti is not only geographically in the middle of this giant ecosystem, but is historically a keystone of it. So, Leti was created in 1967 initially to meet the demand in electronics of the French Atomic Commission. And then we grew up and we are now in the top three in terms of research, technological research organization with a budget of close to three, uh, 300 million and 15, 315 million euros, 2,000 people and 3,000 patents in portfolio. So our mission is to develop disruptive micro and nanotechnologies in the field of microelectronic, optic, photonics, uh, telecommunication, and to either transfer it to industrial partners 
or to create startups. And you can see that we have created uh, over the past 20 years close to 70 startups with a very good activity. Uh, and you can see that 75% uh, of them are still in activity. Uh, so, uh, we are in the top three worldwide in terms of RTO. We have created jobs, we have created starter and startup, and our mission is to transfer technology. In terms of business model, we mainly rely on external funding, both industrial and institutional ones. So, how did we enter into healthcare? So, Leti was incorporated in 1967. And quickly after its creation, Leti researchers started to develop microelectronic and electronic and then microelectronic to support the medical imaging field. And we co-created with Grenoble Hospital the first French wall body X-ray scanner in 1976. And right after that, we diversified our activities in healthcare developing disruptive medical device, safer, miniaturized at home, that we will cover this afternoon. We also develop disruptive, innovative tools for the human and veterinary pharma industry. And we develop components and systems to better control environment. And all of those activities are actually around what we call the one health approach, meaning that we are taking into account not only the human health, but also the, the veterinary health, the animal health, and the environment. So, Sandrine, coming back to your point, uh, biomanufacturing is key. And biomanufacturing is part of the activities we cover in the second step of our activity, which is the development of tools for pharma and biotech industry. And biomanufacturing has been addressed since three years by the French government because it's becoming key. So, short definition before, what we call biomanufacturing is actually the fact of developing or synthesizing a biomedicine thanks to uh, living cells, to make it short. Uh, and this market is actually growing a lot. It's becoming strategic. At the moment, 40% of the drug in development are biomedicines. And we consider that by 2025, half of the drugs on the market will be biomedicines. Why? Why? Because they are more precise, more active, they allow personalized medicine, and they are aligned with the current trend, which is the 5P, the precision medicines. But those biodrugs are highly complex to manufacture because it's based on living cells. Uh, this is a highly variable and long processes. We will cover that this morning with all the speakers, but actually the processes is divided in several steps. First, there is the upstream process, USP, when you develop and you make the cell grow to synthesize the active ingredient. Then you have the downstream process with the purification of the active substance. And then you have the fill and finish part. So the French government wanted to highlight and to strengthen France uh, and French capabilities in this field to optimize our independence and to better react to the future medicine needs. So that's all for me. And I leave you up to the following speaker to cover the points regarding processes and yield improvement. Thank you very much, uh, Nadesh, for, for this uh, clear introduction to uh, bioproduction activities at, at CLAT. Um, so I understand that CLAT is, uh, is a major actor in the field of bioproduction thanks to its uh, scientific expertise. Uh, a strong ecosystem, and we have an example of uh, this ecosystem here in this room, and a well-equipped platform. So the, the, we just mentioned the, the French uh, government investment plan in bioproduction, and this plan relies on industrial champions as well as innovation players. So I'm extremely pleased to welcome on the stage uh, Mr. Eric Calvosa from uh, Sanofi. Uh, so Mr. Calvosa is coordinator of a project called Calypso, and in partnership with Leti, uh, this, uh, this uh, project uh, aims to uh, develop a new approach for bioproduction processes. So Mr. Calvosa um, 
you launched this R&D project last year together with Litty. So what kind of applicative and technical challenges did you have in mind? Did you want to address with this project? Thank you for the invite. Uh, I can answer in five minutes. And um, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, today, we don't live a digital transformation. We live a digital revolution. And I'm trying to develop in five minutes and to demonstrate this part. The main biomedicine in the market are produced in bioreactor. What is a bioreactor? A bioreactor is a closed system, tightly controlled, with a physical parameters, chemical parameters such as uh, speed, temperature, pH, and so on. In the last 20 years, on MAP, for example, we move from 0.1 grams per liter up to 10 grams per liter in the productivity of MAPS. And we need to control the at least 100 biological parameters inside the bioreactor. We need to control the quantity, the quality, and when you introduce your product, and how. Just an example, very simple, in terms of how. It's very, it's very easy to understand when, uh, when you would like to introduce 20 amino acids inside the bioreactor. It's more complex than the final product of a big protein inside the bioreactors. After the active product, you need to purify it by uh, to impurity removal, like uh, DNA or uh, HCP or cell protein. And we need about five to 15 steps at least from time to time is more. And uh, after that, and uh, after observation, we, we can make the observation, we use very few inline sensors in, uh, in the whole process. And the cost sensor could be a limitation or a complexity too, like for example, the, te the Raman technology. And very often we use only one sensor for one measurement. It could be also a limitation and all sensors are currently used by separately. And uh, we don't, the MSPC is a multivariate statistic process control, is still not in place at the moment. And after that, we have for one batch, we need several months from start to the release. And if you would like to increase the productivity, if you would like to increase the quality and the, we would like faster, You need to increase the process control with a specific sensor development at the best step. And we would like to add a bit all sensor the machine learning, process modeling, and retro control processes. For this reason, we have created the Calypso project, and the project has been started 10 months ago uh, for five years. It's a consortium with uh, six French companies. And the three objectives of free innovative access is the first, uh, first axis is the sensor development. The second axis is the dynamic database development. And the third axis is the aggregation of uh, sensor development and dynamic database to develop a prediction, process modelization, and simulation. What can we say after 10 months of a Calypso project launch? Currently, all parameters for development are identified for all processes, for upstream, downstream, and also for mammalian and bacterian cells. The strategy of the sensor development and manufacturing is underway. And we have a very strong synergization between the consortium partners And uh, there are about uh, 70 people involved in the project. We are, we are also engaged on a selfie project who will be presented by uh, Geoffrey Esteban from Ipresens. And in terms of uh, 
global development and the digital uh, development forward for me, sensor, database, machine learning, process modeling. And I would like to add the most important part is the people uh, mindset change. For me, it's the main challenge that we will have in bio process in the next year. I will finish my presentation by the perspective. All innovative technology are already in discussion with the French and the European government for an introduction in the new building. All technology of uh, process control developed can be extrapolated from uh, vaccine, maps, cell therapy, and gene therapy. And I will finish by the acknowledge to uh, CEWA teams and especially to Stanislas Lom who leads this part. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Calvosa, for, for this testimony. So I understand that uh, we still need more innovations to answer bioproduction challenges. It's just the beginning. Thank you again. So now uh, I'm sure you want to learn more about uh, bioproduction technology and microtechnologies, and especially uh, at CELT. So I'm pleased to invite to the stage uh, Dr. Pascal Maillet from uh, CLET. So Pascal belongs to the Microtechnologies for Biology and Healthcare Division. He's a scientific director. Uh, he's the author and co-author of uh, more than 85 publications. He's the owner of 13 patents in bioelectronic, biosensors, and surface chemistry. Um, Pascal. So we know now that CLT is involved in the Calypso project together with the, um, Sanofi and other companies. Uh, so how can microtechnologies at CLT uh, meet bioproduction challenges? Thank you, Sandrine. I will show uh, effectively how we can help for uh, bioproduction and to uh, monitor finally the, the production using microtechnologies. So, as already uh, presented by Mr. Calvosa, you have uh, two steps in the bioproduction st uh, process. You have uh, the upstream and the downstream process. On each of these processes parts needs some sensors for different ta tasks. Typically for the upstream process, what, you, what is needed, required is in-situ sensors that are able to measure what's inside the reactor on how the culture behaves. Whereas in the downstream process, what is needed is more sensors that are used to monitor contamination, to quantify contamination on production. So if we focus first on the upstream process, this is a nice publication that was published uh, last year. You can see here the idea around the control, or the closed loop control of a process. And you can see on the left side that there is a, a strong need in different types of monitoring, including uh, temperature, pressure, that is to say physical parameters, but as well chemicals, physical chemicals parameters and biochemical parameters. There is a need also of controlling the system to generate data on afterward to monitor. You have to control all of the system with a closed loop. Then sensors are finally central in these systems and we need to focus on these different types of measurements in order to help the bioprocesses to, to work better. So what can Leti do for this, he can propose a range of different sensors and you can see here a panel of the sensors that are typically available at CA. By, uh, you can find uh, uh, physical sensors like uh, accelerometers or pressure sensors. You can find as well some uh, spectroscopic analysis uh, like uh, Raman or like, uh, for example, um, uh, MIR uh, spectroscopies. As uh, Mr. Calvosa said before, we are also involved in the imaging process with uh, IPRASENSE, and Mr. Esteban will spoke to you about, uh, speak to you about that after. But also, we developed a range of sensors, electrochemical sensors, 
micromechanical sensors, and you have here, for example, uh, uh, suspended uh, nano resonator uh, systems that will be uh, shown to you this afternoon, or uh, optomechanical uh, uh, sensors, and we developed as well optic on the op on photonic biosensors, including, for example, at the right, the max center uh, interferometers, or at the left, uh, some. Uh, um <coughs> photonic crystals. So, first I will focus a bit on the electrochemical part, which is the main uh, uh, types of sensors we will develop for the uh, upstream process. And typically, why electrochemistry? Because in electrochemistry, you have a range of possibilities in terms of measuring things within uh, a tank. And you can use potentiometry with uh, uh, potentiometric sensors, such as uh, pH sensors. You can also develop some amperometric sensors to develop some uh, redox species that are present in the, in, the, in the batch, or voltammetric sensors to be able to give more specificities regarding the electrochemical process. You can also follow modulating, modulating signal to measure impedance spectroscopy or to measure conductivity within a batch, or you can also use transistor sensors that are more sensitive to recognition events using, for example, antibody uh, recognition processes. And all of these sensors using electrochemistry are quite easy to introduce within a tank. So first, to give you an insight about the, this sensor, there is a first ex uh, example. This is a, a sensor we developed a few years ago with uh, the, the Society Smartins. The idea was to monitor the formulation of a vaccine. And here, the idea is to rationalize time by ch checking, monitoring the mixing process. And uh, typically, what we uh, designed, this is a, a, a conductivity sensor, which is embedded within a small ball that contains all the, uh, the, the, the electronic uh, measurement system and as well uh, the data processing and transmission at the outside of the tank. And by the way, you can see here there is also an accelerometer which is within the, the ball. And by the way, you can see if the mixture is still in working and you can see by uh, the, the, the graph here that the, 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 the ball is still moving within the tank and you can see that the conductivity is uh, evenly uh, the same within the tank. A second uh, application we uh, developed a few uh, the last year, this is an electrochemical platform which is able to measure the evolution of uh, cell cultures. And here the idea was to monitor the cell stress uh, of, uh, of cells using a, a multi-parametric and miniaturized electrochemical platform. You can see on this platform there is eight different sensors that are working in potentiometry and amperometry. And we are able to follow in this way uh, the, uh, ni uh, the nitrogen, nitrogen oxide on nitrite, lactate, hydrogen peroxide on pH in the same time. And what's interesting is that we can see by this it's quite easy, feasible to miniaturize an analytical platform to integrate it within a microfluidic and to measure in a real fluid what is uh, what, how the cell culture behaves. So now I will focus more on the DSP process, the downstream process. For the downstream process, what we have to measure, this is the production of monoclonal antibodies, but also some contamination or residual proteins like protein A, or DNA, for example. And for doing that, what we need is a biosensor. What is a biosensor? This is a, a conjunction of a transducer, that is to say a physical sensor, as I mentioned before, with a bioreceptor, typically an antibody or an aptamer or a DNA strand. And the idea is to measure the recognition event which is linked to the bioreceptor recognition to a signal processing in order to give some insight about the presence of specific species and the specificity is given by the bioreceptor which is graphed on the surface of the sensor. Indeed, for doing so, you have to finally translate a biochemical signal into a physical signal, typically electrical signal. And we can interrogate the transducer surface regarding this recognition event through different types of transducing event, like, for example, an uptake of mass, an inertial mass, using resonators, 
We can also measure a modification of the optical index, like for example with the, um, uh, the photonic crystal, or we can measure a change in the dielectric properties of the interface or of the charge of the interface using uh, electrochemical transistors, like here some uh, graphene-based uh, transistors. What's important in this as well is that you can use all these sensors, but you need a lot of technologies on the surrounding in order to make them working in the real way. On, for example, what you need first is a surface chemistry to graft the specific probes on the surface. Secondly, you need a microfluidic integ integration in order to pick up the fluids from the process in order to flow these fluids at the surface of the sensor. And for that, you need a packaging. And finally, you also need an electronic, an optic integration in order to make working the system. What's important here is that Leti provides all this knowledge in order to give the overall value chain of the sensor production. And typically, sorry, you have here a range of the sensors with uh, the nature of the species that are um, checking for on the level of concentration you find within the flute. And you have typically the different kinds of sensors we developed at CLAT regarding commercial technologies. And you can see here as well the limit <coughs> of detection of these different sensors. And typically, to give an insight, there is a Max Zender inter interferometer, for example, or um, SNR or nanowires that are able to collect some data at the nanogram per milliliter level, whereas we have a brand new systems like optical, uh, optomechanical sensors that are able to give a, a sort of um, very high level of, uh, of uh, sensitivity at the picogram per milliliter level. What's important here is that regarding what you need for your application, we have a typical sensor which is adapted to your need. So now we enter a new paradigm in the, in the bioproduction, as it's mentioned before. We have a strong need in, in sensor for in situ or online monitoring. And CLT offers this range of sensors, biosensors, adapted to the performance that you need for this usage and we provide a complete integration from surface chemistry to packaging on electronics to render possible all these measurements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maillet, for uh, this very detailed talk. So we see that we have uh, plenty of technologies to uh, optimize uh, bioproduction um, processes, and it's probably we need to, to make a, a mixture, a mix different uh, technology to, to achieve good results. So now let's deepen our understanding on, uh, on technologies for bioproduction. And I'd like to invite to the stage two speakers, Mr. Geoffrey Esteban from Iprasens. Iprasens is a, a startup and a history partner of uh, CLT in the field of holographic imaging. And Mr. Geoffrey Esteban is the CEO of uh, this startup. And um, Dr. Guillaume Nonglaton from uh, CLT. Uh, so Mr. Nonglaton is a research expert in surface chemistry. Uh, he belongs to the Microtechnologies for Biology and Healthcare Department at CLAT. So, Mr. Esteban, welcome uh, on the stage and thank you for being here with us. Uh, could you please tell us more about your startup and the technology you propose to optimize bioproduction? Hello, perfect. The presentation is about uh, this. Um, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Esteban, the, the CEO of this company. We have uh, founded, and uh, the introduction uh, for me is very easy. It's been uh, already uh, covered a little bit with the uh, three talks, so uh, we're going to go quick on the um, increase of the, the development of the, the drug in uh, biomedicine, it means bioproduction, a worldwide uh, market, uh, which is uh, huge, and uh, in this market, and growing cells in a bioreactor, we deal here at IPASENS about uh, sensors. And uh, I'm going to present our strategy on inline sensor. It has been also introduced by the, by the talks. So it's a, it's a, it's a need for uh, 
the quality of the process and also for the productivity, uh, the, the better repeatability. And today, uh, there is a need for uh, cell concentration, uh, cell viability, and also cell state through the detection of early uh, death of the cells within the bioreactor, within the bioproduction uh, process. And this is what we want to address at IPRASENSE. Today, we address uh, the cell variability and cell concentration. Uh, but what is important is that when we have uh, created IPRASENSE in 2013, it was already the case. This, is what, this concern that we have today was already the main driver of the, of the company. So at IPRASENSE, we sell instruments and uh, associated consumable. We are located in uh, Montpellier. We are now 10 people, but all over these years, we have made the R&D with uh, CEA, and I would say at CEA because uh, uh, this is a, a yeah, 90% of the uh, uh, research was done with CEA, and we have now today a number of uh, patents together with uh, CEA under license also. Uh, this technology we are talking about for monitoring uh, cells, counting cells, and viability uh, is um, represented on the on the top right. So. We have a simple uh, illumination light, like LED. It goes through the samples. It makes uh, the light uh, goes uh, a diffraction uh, given by the object. And this diffraction we capture on a CMOS sensor. The uh, holograms are uh, reconstructed by the algorithm. And then we reconstruct the image to make the analysis. So with this, we basically capture hologram without optical component, and we make the rest with the calculation and the intelligent uh, algorithm. And all this work is uh, from the CEA development, and we are using this for uh, counting cells and viability. And all of uh, our instruments that you see at the, at the bottom uh, have this technology. So we are today a single technology, and this is what we have inside all the product. Um, again, we count cells. Uh, and, and do viability on uh, cell sample today. Uh, here is one instrument at work inside the uh, industrial instrument. You can recognize the, 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 the Sartorius system that delivers a sample to our system and then we measure automatically and this is for high throughput. So this is the beginning of the, the, the process development um, scale. Uh, a number of examples with uh, cell count and viability. Here we try to demonstrate that it compares well with the uh, reference of the market regarding cell count. This is the Vicel. Uh, this is a project you can see that has been done with many big pharmaceutical uh, companies. Uh, we, our software is part of the product. Another type of product or side uh, um, uh, industry is the live cell imaging that we do more in the research. And this is what uh, we get from the instrument, a movie from the growing cells, so we can identify how many cells, what they are doing, if they are moving directly inside the incubator. And again, with same technology inside, just for a different purpose. Here we, do, we, do, we don't do viability. And uh, finally, to make the link with the bioproduction uh, today, uh, I'm, I'm presenting here the project that we have about putting our cell count and viability technology into the bioreactor. That means online, again, to respond to the need of online sensor. And this is a project that uh, has started uh, recently that we have together with CEA, of course, Leti, uh, Sanofi, and also Servier for the uh, industrial partner. And for the academic, we have uh, uh, CNRS and, uh, and um, yeah, basically, uh, University, Lorraine, MT, Nov, and CNRS are the same uh, place. So what we're trying to do, again, here is to put this uh, small component inside a probe. The probe will go in the bioreactor, and the probe will measure cell count, viability, and to a certain extent, uh, apoptosis, let's say early cell death. Uh, and this is for us a very important uh, project and in the strategy since the beginning of the, the company. So we are very glad to, to uh, and, and look forward to uh, the output of this because this is uh, giving us a, a new possibility to have new product for this uh, growing market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Esteban, from, for this testimony. 
So I just make an announcement is that uh, IpraSense product and the latest version of it uh, will be in demonstration at the showroom. So for people who booked a tour in the showroom, don't miss it. And probably Mr. Esteban himself will, uh, will explain how it works on the real, on the real prototype, well, real products, commercial products. So Guillaume, thank you to be on the stage. Um, so I understood that CLAT could help develop a disruptive way to produce biopharmaceuticals, and in particular thanks to miniaturized systems based on microfluidics. Could you tell us more about mi microfluidics? Thank you, uh, Sandrine. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, I will, uh, I will talk about uh, what LATI can do in terms of uh, production and bioproduction using microfluidic systems uh, for uh, chemical and pharmaceutical uh, industry. So when we talk about uh, chemical uh, industry, you probably have this image in mind. Uh, on one side, these industries have uh, a strong impact on the environment, whether it be on the air uh, we breathe, uh, on the water we drink, or the, on the climate change uh, affecting the wo world world. On the, on the other side, these industries have a strong uh, and an important economic and societal role. Uh, they, have, they are in a situation of strong competition and must continually rely on research and innovation. One of the objectives of the CEA is to help them in their evolution towards a more uh, sustainable production by exploring several solutions. Energy optimization and material savings, uh, reducing factory releases in terms of pollution, uh, securing facilities, valorization of byproducts and heat, and finally, in the longer term, the search for new uh, processes and new production methods. The term factory of the future covers some concepts coming from the consciousness of the need to respect the environment while creating high added value products with clean, safe and energy efficient uh, processes. So at the, chemi at, at the scale of the chemical uh, reaction, engineers and researchers explore new synthetic, uh, uh, new synthesis uh, methods. These methods uh, come from the green chemistry. It means uh, solvent-free, specifically catalyzed, uh, using biosourced or uh, recycled uh, reagents, and minimizing non-recoverable uh, byproducts. This is typically the case of biocatalysis, which uses enzymes, uh, leads to more uh, energy-efficient processes, and reduces toxic uh, reagents and waste. At the level of the process itself, um, the great revolution is in the design of flexible and adaptable processes. Flexibility uh, allows versatility, but also optimization at different uh, intermediate scales. It's a question of uh, adopting the design principle of continuous processes at production scales, where the batch reactor was traditionally used. The intensification of processes um, based on microreactors or microstructured reactors uh, leads to a change in technologies. The goal is to ensure a localized and perfectly controlled production of intermediate products. Moreover, with this uh, microreactor technology, we can adapt the structure of the equipment to the optimal condition of the physical biochemical uh, transformation. So to do so, CLAT, uh, at CLAT we have all the skills in-house, uh, including expertise in microfluidic, in chemistry and in biology, in addition, of course, uh, to, the skill, to the skills in silicon microtechnology. Our dedicated platform, located in a clean room, is equipped with uh, state-of-the-art equipment for the assembly and the coating of microfluidic uh, components. The platform, in connection with the microelectronic platforms, uh, allows us to develop, uh, to manufacture and to test innovative solutions in terms of microfluidic design, surface functionalization, 
organic synthesis and integrated uh, cellular and, uh, and um, molecular biology. To illustrate what Leti can do uh, in, this, uh, in this field of uh, production, I'm going to I'm going you to to present two uh, two two kind of uh, project, one uh, on the process aspect and the other one on the biocatalysis aspect. So the first project is called uh, Lotus and it concerns the, um, the 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 production of radiopharmaceuticals. So uh, if you think of the future of therapeutic uh, innovation, you probably know that there is a considerable need for biomarkers um, to improve the, the prediction, the diagnosis, and the follow-up of the disease. Development of radiopharmaceuticals specific to a pathology or a technology is crucial to meet these challenges. In collaboration with the company PMB, Uh, CES worked on a disruptive technological approach for the production of radiopharmaceuticals for PET, positron emission tomography. We have developed in this context an integrated and automated radiochemical synthesis automaton working on demand at the macrofluidic scale, uh, ranging from the production to the uh, of the uh, radioisotope directly to the syringe for injection into the patient. Ultimately, this, uh, this concept makes it possible to obtain a personalized uh, radiopharmaceutical in a few minutes at the hospital. More precisely, this automaton has the function of ma uh, managing uh, automatically a single-use microfluidic cassette dedicated to a radiosynthesis process. So in this uh, project, uh, Leti has manufactured two types of microfluidic uh, cassettes for the synthesis of radioligands. One for the neurodegeneration and the other one for the central and peripheral inflammatory disease. As Leti cannot have uh, hot laboratories in the Grenoble site, we did all the uh, cold uh, synthesis to determine the optimal conditions uh, of the radiosynthesis and to develop the microfluidic uh, system. And then we uh, successfully transfer to, uh, to our industrial partner, PMB. The second project I would like to talk is um, MicroBioCat, and uh, it concerns the biocatalysis in continuous flow. So as you probably know, biocatalysis uh, makes it possible through enzymes uh, to carry out under mild conditions Uh, very some very specific chemical reactions that are often uh, uh, impossible uh, to carry out in, in conventional organic chemistry. Biocatalysis is very competitive because of its ratio uh, and, ster and stereo selectivity, its high yields, and uh, the low number of side reactions that greatly simplify the purification steps. So here, in collaboration with um, a fundamental and technological researcher uh, from uh, CEA, Leti have developed a new mode of uh, production of molecules by enzymatic cascade uh, based on continuous flow production, combining macro and microfluidics. The idea was to move from a batch production mode to a highly parallelized uh, continuous uh, produ production mode. The in The innovation in this project was essentially at two levels. First, the development of a method of immobilizing the enzymes that guarantee their stability and allow their reuse. And then the scale up and the, the continuous operation of an enzymatic millireactor. A first demonstration of an enzymatic uh, uh, cascade using two enzymes, a deoxygenase and a decarboxylase, in an heterogeneous uh, medium has been obtained for uh, the synthesis of some polymer uh, precursors. Then the biosynthesis of uh, vitamin B3, initially developed in a uh, fixed bed reactor, was successfully transposed into an innovative PMMA pillar reactor. 
We also specially designed a, a, a reactor allowing an effective mixing between the substrate and the enzyme while reducing pressure uh, and uh, pressure drops and uh, production cost. And to go further, we now imagine the parallelization of fluidic components, the integration of raw cell catalysts, and the production of an, on an industrial scale. So this was two examples of what LETI can do in this field. I hope I have convinced you that um, uh, CLAT is the right place to, to develop new processes uh, for more sustainable uh, uh, and delocalized bioproduction using microfluidic system. So thank you for uh, your attention and uh, please feel free to ask me questions after the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Nanglaton. <laughs> So let's place our bets on microfactories for continuous flow monitoring. <laughs> Thank you again. So we have seen how microtechnologies could optimize um, biomanufacturing bio processes. Now let's switch to another topic, which is uh, how to uh, deliver innovative biotherapies. So in this session, we will talk about uh, vectorization, design, biotherapies. Uh, so for, for this uh, topic, I'd like to invite to the stage Dr. Cécile Chalier from uh, Siva Animal Health. Welcome on the stage, uh, Dr. Chalier. So uh, Dr. Chalier is the head of uh, biotherapeutics. In the, she works in the Open Innovation Department at uh, Siva. Uh, Mrs. Chalier. What are the development challenges at SIVA in terms of delivery of innovative biotherapies? Thank you, Sandrine, for the questions. Um, before, I would like to give you some, uh, I would say, information regarding uh, vet pharma, because probably you don't really know this field. By the way, do, do you know some innovative products in vets? Disturbing question, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah? But I think there are some of you that are using Feliway diffuser. That is a very simple diffuser that you plug into an electrical sock to calm down your cat, to let him down uh, relaxing. So it is really an innovative project. And behind this product is a French vet pharma company called Siva, Siva Animal Health. So Siva, was created uh, more than 20 years ago. And since then, the, the growth uh, is exponential and constant, with an, a fold increase of uh, more than uh, 11. We are now uh, on the top five position worldwide. So it is quite uh, an honor, I would say. And uh, we are implanted in more than 46 countries and investing each year 100 millions of euros in R&D. Well, our activities, we are covering four different spaces, the companion animals, poultry, ruminants, and swine. And we have two main pillars, I would say classical one, vaccines and pharma products. Pharma products meaning small molecules. In companion animals, uh, the conventional approach was to take small molecules coming from either human health or agrochemical sector not very innovative, but the innovation was driven by the way to deliver this product to the companion animals. We need to identify the right formulation, specific devices in, some, in certain uh, condition, and also, uh, for instance, release the um, sustained release uh, system. But what is completely new in this field is the biotechnology. We see now arriving monoclonal antibodies for pets, we see also arriving new type of molecule, sCRNA, mRNA, gen and cell therapy. It's really a new way to treat our pets. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. In livestock, the challenge is um, very big. You need to know that in uh, 2050, we will need to feed 10, 10 billion of people, meaning that we need to increase by twice milk production and meat production. And that 
by taking care about animal welfare and our environment. This is a big challenge. And for that, the only way to do that is to have innovative vaccines. So, so far we are using, I would say, traditional attenuated live vaccine, but always with an innovative way to deliver these vaccines. For instance, we have developed an in ovo system that is an injectable able to deliver the vaccine directly, directly into the eggs. But we have also implemented new type of platforms like viral vector platforms as well as genomic uh, platform, an RNA platform. And actually, I want to rectify something today. The RNA vaccines are not new in, uh, for COVID. There were actually two RNA vaccines on the market before, but in vet pharma. So what we were looking here by the, the partnership we have with the CEA was to identify new formulation, nano formulation for our RNA platform, RNA vaccine platform, able to reach our criteria. The first criteria is to have nano, nano formulation of uh, our RNA vaccine that is stable at four degrees. The other criteria is the low cost of the final product. When we are talking about a vaccine for a chicken, it's less than one euro. And finally, the last criteria, we need to have a very flexible and simple product to prepare at the end. So we need to have a mix and go technology. And for that, we implemented the partnership with the CEA to evaluate and optimize their nano formulation for our RNA platform. So I will let uh, Nadesh comment on the second part. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Chalier, for your testimony. I think it, it highlights how animal health is really part of uh, the global healthcare uh, industry. And uh, it also illustrates the LITI One Health uh, uh, strategy that uh, Nadej uh, uh, introduced earlier this morning. So um, now we, we should have had uh, Mr. Fabrice Navarro on the stage. Unfortunately, he called this morning and he couldn't make it. So thank you, Nadesh, for replacing him on the spot <laughs> with uh, such a very short notice. So um, I can introduce, uh, I can introduce uh, Fabrice uh, anyway, because he prepared the presentation. So Fabrice is uh, the head of the microfluidic systems and bioengineering labs. Uh, so, Nadej, I introduced you this morning. You are deputy head of uh, the Microtechnologies for Biology and Healthcare Division at CLAT. So, um, Fabrice Labs developed a technology called Lipidots. So, what is this technology and how does it fuel uh, new bio biotherapeutic approaches? Thank you, Sandrine. So I will try to, to cover this point and to answer this question. So you've seen before uh, with uh, Cecil's speech that new vaccines uh, in production and in development need uh, nanotechnology to support them delivery and to improve their efficiency. And that's what we have developed at CLAT for more than 15 years now. So I will talk about the Lipidot technology. So these lipidots are what we call lipid nanoparticles, but this is the second generation of lipid nanoparticles. Not with an aqueous core, but with a solid core made of oil and wax. So uh, we've developed and we have patented this technology, which is covered by 50 patents over the, the past uh, 15 years, as I said before. And the characteristic of this technology, so you can see we have a monolayer of phospholipid with a shell that is forming the shell with the PEG, polyethylene glycol. And this lipid nanoparticle of second generation has proven an outstanding colloidal stability at four degrees. So nude and nature, they have already a very good stability at four degrees. And that could be in liquid form, but that could also be lyophilized ly sorry, and spread dried if needed. So, of course, since the beginning, we had in mind all the industrial constraints of those technologies. So we know that some lipid nanoparticles are not stable enough to support the industrial process. So what we have done first is that we have identified FDA-approved components to put into the nanoparticle. And then, since the beginning, we have chosen and developed the nanoparticle in order to make it industrializable and to use industrial equipment. 
So in terms of size, and if we go back to the structure of the nanoparticle itself, it has a tunable size from 30 to 100 nanometers, depending on the use and the use case of those nanoparticles. We will see that later on. At the beginning, 15 years ago, we started uh, to work on medical imaging. You remember, I said before this morning that we entered into the healthcare thanks to medical imaging. So naturally, at the beginning of this technology, we use it uh, for in vivo diagnostic, uh, transporting dyes into uh, the, the, the core of the nanoparticle. That's what you can see on the uh, top left. Then, a few years after, we moved to uh, the vectorization of chemical drug for drug delivery, because some drugs are not stable enough and require uh, uh, vectorization to be more precise and more efficient, as we said before. That, that's the case of chemotherapy uh, drugs and photodynamic therapy. Uh, here, we are still working on it, but I would say that several solutions already exist in the market, like liposomes, for instance. Where we are much more uh, differentiated is on the vaccine part and the adjuvant delivery system. So for more than uh, six years now, we are developing a new approach for vaccines, uh, for vaccines delivery and adjuvant delivery. And I will cover that in the later slides. And for more than uh, four years now, we have also developed cationic uh, formulation of the lipidot to cover uh, the need of uh, I would say nucleic acid delivery, both small nucleic acid like sCRNA, but also longer nucleic acid such as messenger RNA, mRNA. Okay, so let's start with uh, lipidot used as adjuvant delivery system. So as I said before, we started to work on lipidot uh, six years ago to transport either small protein, peptides, but also bigger protein such as monoclonal antibodies. So both for targeting delivery, but also for drug delivery, for instance, monoclonal antibodies. And then we uh, studied uh, the immunogenicity effect of the lipidot using uh, first a use case, which is ovalbumin, uh, and we uh, grafted ovalbumin on the lipidot to see what is the immune response which we triggered. Once we have proven that with ovalbumin, we moved to a much more difficult case, which is the P24, the antigen of HIV. Uh, so we uh, had a very good publication in Nature Vaccines uh, four years ago. Uh, and in this publication, we have proven the efficiency of lipidot to uh, vectorize the P24 protein from the HIV capsid uh, in a double vectorization with a CPG adjuvant. And we have not only done that in mice, but also in non-human primate. Non primate. And here are the results. So what you can see in yellow and in uh, green, and in, uh, sorry, in red, is that uh, once the P24 protein is injected alone, or alone or, vector, or vectorized with the adjuvant, the CPG adjuvant, the immune response, both cellular and humoral, is not that good. But you can see in green color that if we perform a double vectorization, meaning grafting the P24 on the lipidot, but also grafting the CPG adjuvant on the lipidot, here we have a real and strong immune response proven in primates with a sustainable response over 30 weeks. So by doing this, we have proven the efficiency of the lipidot to transport and to trigger a immune response, targeting naturally the dendritic cells. So that was for the proteic part, I would say. Then we have switched to the use of lipidot to deliver the RNA, the RNA. So what we had to do here is to change the formulation of lipidot that we have patented, of course, to uh, manufacture cationic lipidot. So we have done a lot of uh, planification experience, playing with the size of PEG, with the composition of phospholipid, and we had several types of lipidot uh, with several sites that could be used either to transport small uh, RNA or bigger RNA. Okay, so we've started developing the formulation and find the right size. And then we did the experiment, still keeping in mind that those formulations had to be, has to be at one point of time, manufactured. Uh, 
So if we compare with the current nanoparticle that we have on the market, for instance, the SNALP that are used for uh, mRNA vaccines, COVID vaccines, for instance, uh, you can see that we have a core that is solid, meaning that the manufacturing is easier, uh, not only in terms of uh, stability, but also cheaper uh, and more versatile because that, that's a, a plug and play, I would say, when you add the mRNA at the end of the process. So you can manufacture the nanoparticule and then adding the mRNA. While in the SNALP, for instance, you have to put the mRNA at the beginning of the nanoformulation process or during the nanoformulation process that could fragilize a bit the nanoparticule. So we have proven a very good stability uh, of the lipidot, even uh, transporting the mRNA at four degrees, at least uh, three months stability proven from now. And we have validated the manufacturing process with a partner that is uh, GTP BioWays, a French CDMO, uh, and at CA and with GTP, we have the full value chain from the development of the new formulation to the scale-up in a GMP-like condition in a platform that we have in Toulouse, to the GMP uh, manufacturing at uh, GTP BioWays or at an industrial partner that may be interested in the solution. So as a conclusion, Lipidot, uh, CA technology, is a novel, in the novel nano formulation for biomedicine and particularly in, for vaccines. That's a stable and safe nano formulation. We have done a lot of proof of concept since 15 years in several uh, animals, including non-human primates. And we are able to produce it in GMP condition with our partner, uh, GTP uh, BioWays. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nadej. Very impressive. So we have seen uh, how to optimize biomanufacturing. We have seen how to uh, deliver drugs and biotherapies. Now let's move to another topic, which is organ on ship and organoid on, uh, organoid on ship for bioproduction. So for this, I'd like to invite to the stage Professor Edith Filler from ICAR Group, and Mrs. Marilyn Cosnier from CLAT. So Professor Filler is scientific director at uh, ICAR Group, and she has published more than 150 international papers. So Mrs. Filler, welcome on the stage. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, could you tell us about uh, the tissue engineering revolution and its impact on bioproduction and biotherapies? Okay. Um, thank you uh, to, to, to uh, Leti for inviting Group ICAR uh, to participate in this uh, event. And uh, me, I'm, I'm very happy to tell you uh, a little bit uh, about the story we have done uh, with uh, ICAR and uh, where we want to go. Uh, so, uh, who is uh, ICAR? Uh, over the past 25 years, uh, the ICAR group uh, specialist uh, in healthcare product safety control is an international group uh, spread of two sites uh, in uh, French, uh, first in Clermont-Ferrand and uh, in Bordeaux, and uh, two sites in uh, Switzerland and Brazil, with more than 2,000 customers spread of 40 countries. Um, you have to know that uh, manufacturers uh, of medical devices need to assess uh, the biocompatibility of their material and processes by taking a holistic risk-based approach to their biological safety evaluation. And uh, with the group ICAR, we carry out a wide range of laboratory tests to ensure the quality and safety of medical devices in compliance with applicable harmonized standards. So the test include, includes uh, cytotoxicity, intradermal irritation, acute systemic toxicity, chronic toxicity, and so on. Um, what is the context and challenges? Uh, you have to know that uh, you, the use of uh, animals for research Purposes such as drug testing, uh, disease modeling, safety testing, physiology has long been a major of controversy. Uh, indeed, animal models, as you know, do not always reflect the physiology and uh, the complexity of human skin. 
And so uh, the data uh, that ca um, can be poorly uh, representative of actual condition. And f finally, animal models have a very ethical challenges. Uh, the formal uh, encouragement to use alternative in Europe was set in stone by the Europe Directive on Animal Testing in 1986 and revised in uh, 2010. This last directive states that an animal's uh, test may not be conducted in an alternative method is available. So, this directive must be applied to all uses, basic, apply research, and uh, e efficacy. In this line, you have to know that several in vitro protocols, including tissue and generic device ones, uh, have been designed to increase human-like predictive response and reduce animal use, especially for toxicological use and for personal care, product and relative raw materials. And the last few years have seen the rapid development of several complex 3D models, mimicking both the functionality and the structure of the skin, which is a very complex organ. Um, what is the objective of ICAR Group? The objective is to develop and promote, and promote alternative and complementary in vitro techniques to in vivo study in order to restrict animal experimentation, this in accordance with the three rule animal in research. And a second objective is to open new markets for us, such as dermocosmetics and cosmetics, and to assess also toxicology and molecules penetration. With the LETI, we won the project entitled Skin on a Chip 3D Cells Project, which is a feasibility study to develop a skin on chip model. But what is the project? So, the biggest challenge for this project is to mimic the response of the human tissue by recreating skin microenvironment vascularization, for example, and immunocompetence and also mechanical stimulation. Uh, the contribution of the CERA teams is to manage the project and to prove a concept. And uh, you have to know that uh, LETI secures ICAR in the first stage of the development process, this innovation having a high technological context for uh, the group ICAR. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Filler. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. So, Mrs. Konsny, thank you for being on the stage. So, you are an engineer and project manager at CLET. You work in the microtechnologies for biology and healthcare division. So, one of your interests is organ-on-chip and organoids. Could you please describe some of the technologies in development in your lab? Thank you, Sandrine. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Edith, for the, uh, to have introduced the subject. So my name is Marilyn Kosny, and I'm going to talk about microfluidics and bioengineering for organ on chip and organoid on chip. So as Edith has uh, introduced the subject, uh, today in France, around two million animals are used uh, for scientific purposes. These animal models are used for uh, fundamental research and also for applicative research and in drug discovery and, uh, and uh, validation and also in uh, therapy discovery and validation. But obviously, these animal models are not always uh, uh, representative enough of human uh, physiology. So uh, today, the scientific community needs uh, for need a uh, more relevant, a uh, more specific, and available alter alternative models. The challenge here is to find a way to recapitulate the complex human tissues in vitro. So the organoid and the organ and chip and organoid technologies could be an answer. These technologies come from the convergence between the microfluidics and cell biology, and uh, this combination will permit in, in vitro study of human physiology in an organ-specific context. Uh, in combining these technologies, we can culture human tissues in vitro, uh, surrounded by uh, vasculator-like perfusion, 
containing also a natural tunable microenvironment. And uh, with this uh, integration, we can also integrate sensors to recapitulate, to monitor the, the, the environment and the biological unit. By this way, we can uh, design a wide variety of organs, like brain, pancreas, kidney, fat tissues, or skin. So our concept at CLAT to uh, face this challenge is to develop a hosting platform for 3D cell sculpture and organoid and or organoid sculpture. So we are working on a new generation of scalable organon chips, incorporating more technology and sensors to provide an appropriate solution for a specific biological issue. So our concept is illustrated on the picture on the right. So we can see in the center the integrate uh, complex biology, which could be cell co-culture, or also organoids or tumoroids. Uh, this biological unit is surrounded by a specific natural microenvironment, which will be uh, as much as possible close to the in vivo real microenvironment of the biological unit. This platform could implement also a multi-material hybrid approach in order to uh, take advantage of the different material as polymer or silicone. And this, uh, our capacity of uh, integration uh, could also, um, um, we could also uh, integrate sensor, both optical or electrochemical sensor. And we are working with an industrial manufacturing goal that is to say, we anticipate the potential following industrialization, industrialization steps. So to develop such um, a new uh, hosting platform, a multidisciplinary approach is required. So at CLAT, we have skills in microfluidics, in silicon technology, in bioengineering, and uh, in the same place and in mixing these different technology and uh, these different skills, technology and expert, we can manage microfluidic development, sensor implementation and also complex biology integration in the system. So let me illustrate this, um, this uh, multidisciplinary approach implementation uh, that is uh, uh, used for developing our pancreas on chip. So we use microfluidic skills to um, manage precisely, easily, and automatically fluid flows in the organ on chip, as you can see on the picture on the left. Uh, and um, the biological unit will be integrated in a chamber um, uh, equipped with tiny pillars, as you can see uh, on the picture. Or uh, this, on this picture, the chamber is made of polymer, or we can also integrate uh, biological units in a silicon uh, chamber, as you can see on the second picture. So the choice between the material uh, will uh, depend on the need of downsizing or integration of the system. And on the third uh, picture on the right, you can see how we succeed to integrate a, a endothelial vascular, uh, an endothelial network in our uh, platform. So you can see the, the network in green, so it's a tube-like uh, vasculature. And in the middle of this, um, of this network, we also integrate a Langerhans islet that you can see on the picture in red. And uh, the Langerhans islet is the endocrine part of a pancreas, which produces the insulin to regulate the glycemia in blood. So here we succeed to integrate this Langerhans islet, which is surrounded and connected to the endothelial network, to form the a functional endocrine part of the pancreas in our platform, in which we can manage fluids and monitor uh, some parameter, some biological or physical parameters. So with this polymer and inbreed uh, microfluidic cartridge, we manage to maintain the viability of this uh, uh, Langerhans islet and the stability of the surrounding endothelial network for over one month. 
So we have some, we, you can see some uh, reference uh, in the slide uh, concerning this work. So to conclude, I would say that uh, at CLAT we have skills and experience to develop and optimize um, uh, in vitro physiological models to face the challenge to develop new solutions which will be representative of humans, biologically relevant and scalable. And this work, this work takes us towards personalized medicine and further to uh, regenerative medicine. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Kosnier. So thank you, thank you again for all the speakers. I think we can thank the for the quality and also to respect the schedule.